Okay, I think we can probably get started. Welcome everybody to this session of the Politics and Sociology Seminar Series at UCL CIS. My name is Ben Noble, I'm lecturer in Russian politics at CIS and co-chair of the seminar series alongside Dr. Aglaya Snetkov. The session's being recorded, so please leave the camera off for the duration if you're in the audience and don't want your face to appear on YouTube. We're really delighted to be joined today by Dr. Uh, Olga Zavalyova, who will give a presentation titled Carcerality, Class and Ethnicity in Estonia. Olga has a PhD in sociology from the University of Cambridge and a PhD in sociological theory and methods from the High School of Economics in Russia. Olga is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki on a European Research Council funded project, uh, Gulag Echoes, within which she works on social control in the context of penal systems in Russia. Russia and Estonia. Olga will speak for around 20 minutes before Q&A and I'll run through the logistics of how to ask a question after Olga has presented her research. So without further ado, Olga, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if for some reason at any point my sound uh, doesn't work anymore or something, please make faces or wave and um, I'll try to do something about that. But uh, thanks for uh, the invitation. Um, Ben and Aglaya, and thank you for the very easy organization of today. Um, so today I wanted to talk about punishment and marginality in, in Estonia, and to zoom in on the intersections between class and ethnicity uh, in an Estonian context. So the ideas I'm going to present here today, um, I'm going to warn you, are based on a very preliminary study that's been cut a little bit short by the pandemic, but um, thankfully we're able to move through it nonetheless very slowly. Um, so uh, these are very much preliminary ideas based on the first leg of field work that we've done. So first I'll talk about my theoretical framing a little bit uh, and I'll present my main argument and then I'll go on to some of the methodological underpinnings of this work and share my preliminary results. So I wanted to start with a very general uh, social sciences puzzle, which deals at a very basic level uh, with how we as social scientists can work simultaneously with state policy uh, and the bottom up narratives of people who are affected by state policies. So how can we bridge these two levels of analysis without somehow making these huge conceptual leaps? Um, that's kind of the, the problem that, that I want to look at. Um, here you'll see that I'm, I'm trying to bridge something called habitus and the state. So uh, I use the word habitus for these bottom up micro processes of identity making and, and people's general position in the social world. So you'll see later how this study is informed by a Bourdieuian framework where this term comes from. So the more specific question I'm interested in uh, with regard to marginality in Estonia is how does the state produce it? And what do marginalized groups and people, and how do marginalized groups uh, and people in Estonia construct their own identity and their own sense of being? So I tackle this question in relation to prisoners specifically. Uh, these are people who are widely considered to be at the very, very bottom of the social hierarchy, who've been branded as criminals by the state. Uh, and so I tackle this topic by turning my attention to how class and ethnicity intersect in producing marginality uh, in a prison setting. So one of the most inspiring theorists uh, who, who tackles marginality sociologically is the US-based sociologist Louis Guacan, whose work, uh, who works in a Bourdieuian theoretical tradition. And he's tried to produce theories of marginality for both sides of the Atlantic. And he's argued, uh, if, if I try to uh, sum this up uh, very, in a very concise fashion, he's argued that in the USA, urban marginalization is determined by ethnicity or race, uh, in the case of the USA, we usually say, and it's inflected by class. And then in contrast to this in France and other European countries, he says it's rooted in class inequality and it's inflected by ethnicity. So 
here I want to ask exactly what is happening in Estonia and whether one of these two models actually helps explain the Estonian case. And jumping ahead, I'll, I'll give you the answer right away. So I'll show that Estonia actually mirrors the case of the USA. So marginalization is determined by ethnicity and inflected by class. And also, um, it has a lot to do with territorial stigma, just like in the case of the USA. And the ethnic group that's marginalized in Estonia is ethnic Russians, or even broader than that, it's actually Russian native speakers. Uh, and so all of this in the case of Estonia is also rooted in this anti-Soviet nature of Estonia's post-Soviet politics. So I'll explain all that as we go on. Just to give you some context, um, as Ben mentioned, the study I'm talking about is part of a much larger project. Uh, it's based at the University of Helsinki. It's called Gulag Echoes, and it's funded by the ERC. Um, and it looks at how ethnicity and ethnic identity is constructed in a number of country cases. Uh, Estonia is just one of them. We're also looking at Georgia, and my colleague Costanza is here, uh, who's doing that country case. And we're looking at Russia and Romania. And so I'm, I'm responsible for the Estonian case. And the project is headed by Judith Paolo. So miraculously, we were able to conduct some field work in Estonia. Um, I took several trips with, uh, with Judith, with the PI of the project. And uh, we visited the Ministry of Justice uh, before the pandemic, or rather we had sort of a conference with them. And then we went back to Estonia again to do about 13 interviews this summer. And then I did another interview online after that. Uh, we did some of the interviews together and uh, some separately. So some of the study participants were interviewed by two people together. We have 10 long biographical interviews with all male former prisoners. These lasted about two to three, three and a half hours each. Then we have also four interviews with people who work in prisoner rehabilitation in Estonia and notes from our meeting with the Ministry of Justice. So I won't have time to dive fully into interview transcripts and details, but I'll be drawing on these interviews and I'll also be try drawing on various census data and official statistics, um, which I gathered as, as we went along. So our field work was based mostly in, in this Part of the country, the Northeast that's circled here. A couple of interviews were done in Tallinn as well. And um, here you can see one of the towns we visited. It's called Silene. And uh, this is actually very classical skull and aerial architecture that you see on, on the photograph. In this particular town, over 90% of people who live there are native Russian speakers. So that gives you an idea of the demographic of, of this type of area we were in. And most of our work was done in this county called Ida Diru County in the Northeast. It's one of the poorest regions of the country and it's marked by intense deindustrialization, which began in the 1990s and by very high, well, higher than in the other regions of Estonia unemployment rates. Our specific field site was a halfway house that was um, situated right near this prison. This is called the uh, the Viru prison in the town of Jochi. It's one of the three new, brand new prisons of Estonia. And over the past few years, um, they closed all the 10 Soviet uh, style prisons. Uh, these were barrack, open plan sort of barrack prisons, typical of the Soviet Union. And these were all replaced by three prisons that more or less look like this with cellular accommodation, like you see on the picture. And this is the complete break from Soviet penality and Soviet penal architecture. Informally, other study participants called these Euro prisons. And um, I'll talk about how ambiguous the reaction to this change was among, among the pris former prisoners we talked to. These are some images of old style prisons. These are uh, images from Russia actually, but the, the prisons were the same in Estonia uh, before this reform. Um, these were less clean spaces, less orderly maybe. And uh, they had people living in dorm style communal accommodation. So people were generally free to walk around the premises, including the outdoors area. 
and they were even responsible, the prisoners were responsible for the upkeep of the facilities and the territory. And this is very different from what we have now with these small cells that you saw in the previous picture. Mostly prisoners now are allowed to go outside one hour a day. There's a blanket ban on smoking, um, which actually was instituted overnight, not too long ago from one day to the next, uh, probably very tough on many people. Um, and um, in some of the prisons, this daily walk is actually taken not on the ground, not on the grass, but on the roof of the building. So there aren't really communal areas for socializing either. And even food is often eaten inside the cell instead of in the cafeteria like before. So I'll come back to this architecture a little later, but now I want to turn to sort of another uh, facet of, of uh, marginality in Estonia, which is how citizenship functions in Estonia, because it's a very peculiar system that's very closely related to uh, what I want to say about the prison system. So the Russian speaking minority of Estonia is the largest minority in that country. It makes up 29.6% of the population. And about one third of all of these people, uh, the Russian speakers live in this Idevuru county where we did our work. Poverty and unemployment are more prevalent among Russian speakers compared to the rest of the population, which partly hinges on this territorial uh, distribution of the group. So Estonia's Russian speakers today are mostly descendants of Soviet era migrants to Estonia, which includes people from uh, the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic, but also Ukrainians, Belarusians, Tatars, Jews, and, and so on, who were overwhelmingly Russian speakers. And there's a difference uh, between Estonia in this regard and its neighbors. So Soviet era migration to Latvia was mostly white collar workers and migration to Estonia was predominantly blue collar workers. And after the Soviet Union collapsed, the citizenship laws of uh, independent Estonia didn't explicitly contain any clause about ethnicity or ethnic belonging, but uh, they turned to the citizenship law of 1938 as the basis of the new citizenship law. This de facto excluded all of these immigrants who came or who were born, who came to Estonia or who were born in Estonia during the Soviet period. Um, and again, this is mostly Russian speakers. And the people who did not fall under the 1938 citizenship law and couldn't obtain Estonian citizenship that way had two ways of, of getting Estonian citizenship. Um, first, if their parents or they signed a petition for Estonian independence in the late 80s, and this was a very politically risky kind of act and a minority of people did this. And the second way was to undergo a complex process of naturalization. And this involved taking an Estonian language test. And here it's important to remember that Estonian is actually very different from Russian and it's not the simplest language. Um, so a lot of people either failed or just didn't even try. Um, and as a result, Estonia became the sort of unique case among the Baltic states where uh, the non-ethnic Estonian minority had the least access to citizenship after the country gained independence. Um, Estonia also forbade dual citizenship, which at the time uh, left Russian speakers who may have felt a bit displaced by shifting borders with, with this difficult choice of which citizenship they would take. So today among Russian speakers in Estonia, 86.55% are citizens of Estonia, 6.9, uh, well, almost 7% are citizens of Russia, and 6.5% are stateless persons or holders of gray passports. So these gray passports are another peculiar uh, sort of facet of, of belonging in Estonia. They were introduced in 1996, um, given to stateless persons who failed to obtain Estonian citizenship. Uh, and these were mostly Russian speakers. So today, uh, gray passport holders are largely excluded from politics from political decision making because they're only permitted to vote in, in sort of local municipal elections and can't hold public office. They also don't have free 
uh, sort of access to, to freedom of uh, labor within the EU very easily. And um, not surprisingly, unemployment rates among great passport holders are 1.5 to two times higher than among those who hold Estonian passports. Um, however, an advantage is uh, that great passport holders have visa-free access to Russia, which helps with trade, but also with smuggling connections. So we know gray passport holders are excluded from the political processes of Estonia um, and they're disadvantaged in this way. But another major factor that's known to foreclose upward social mobility is a criminal record, the criminal record of the individual. So here we kind of veer back to prisons. Gray passport holders are extremely vastly overrepresented in Estonian prisons. Uh, there are 6% of gray passport holders in the overall population. And in prisons, there are about 35% uh, of people who have gray passport holders. And this disproportion can be compared to the over-incarceration of African-Americans in the USA, where 13% of the total population is African-American and 40% of the incarcerated population is African-American. So these people are silenced electorally, but also they're excluded from official accounts of economic well-being as prisoners often are. These hidden inequalities are carceral, carceral inequalities. They're cumulative because uh, of the economic penalties of imprisonment, which affect those who were already in a weak economic position. And they're also intergenerational. We spoke to many people whose parents had been to prison and whose children ended up in prison as well. So now that I've touched upon uh, sort of the types of territorial, civic, and economic inequalities that we find, um, that we found when researching this topic, I want to briefly bring attention to four major aspects of prison reform that took place uh, in Estonia after the breakup of the Soviet Union. So this is sort of the state side of policy. So the first thing I already talked about is prison architecture. Um, as I said, this was a really ambiguous change. Prisons became cleaner and probably safer for some prisoners. Uh, the aim was largely to break with Soviet practice, but the breakup of communal living also broke up community in a way. And here, yes, gangs, prison gangs are a form of community indeed. Uh, but there were other forms of community that were broken up. For example, people could no longer garden outside. And I heard many sort of nostalgic narratives of people planting potatoes in these old barrack style prisons, which is no longer possible. Um, so another really important thing that happened was a reform in prison guard requirements for the job in the 2000s. Before prisons were largely run by Russian speaking prison personnel. And now, um, there is a new language requirement, which means that you have to pass an Estonian language test to qualify for becoming a prison guard. And during the changeover that happened when this new um, uh, rule was introduced, many of the old guards were unable to pass the test and they were sort of cycled out. Uh, and over time, prison guards became mostly uh, first language Estonian speakers. And we heard a lot of narratives of sort of everyday forms of resistance to this new type of prison guard. For example, when prisoners who even do speak Estonian refuse to speak Estonian to the guards and force them to either speak the Russian they could or call a superior or something like this. Another interesting thing uh, about the prisons is how is the role language plays in everyday life. So it's such an important marker that it's enshrined on identity tags that the prisoners wear on their clothes. So the system is divided by letter and you, you, it's A, B, C, and A means a prisoner has a low level of Estonian language, B is medium, and C is a high level of language skills um, and or, or native speakers. And the name tag system actually used to be based on numbers. And then the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture complained about the one, two, three system. And so following this condemnation, uh, the system was changed to A, B, C. Uh, so, on the last kind of important and interesting reform that took place in the 2010s was uh, the introduction of a policy called spatial security. Uh, 
which allows the Estonian state to deport convicted people whose prison system, uh, sentences have come to an end who hold Russian passports. And this past summer in July, the European Court of Human Rights actually ruled in favor of Estonians' right to do this in a case uh, called uh, Grigori Shirbakov versus Estonia. This man was born in Estonia, his family lives in Estonia, but he'll be deported to Russia. He'll face a five-year entry ban to Estonia. And interestingly, the court argued that uh, this man learned Estonian only in the prison, which uh, was an argument about his weak ties to the Estonian state. And this is a clear example of exclusion based on language. So um, I won't have time to go into sort of prisoner narratives, but I'll go over um, sort of a very quick overview of the trends we saw in our interviews because the interviews paint an extremely different picture from the picture I just painted based on sort of official statistics and policies. Um, so these bottom up narratives um, show that um, mostly uh, the prisoners we talked to who, who were mostly, I have to stress here, Russian speakers, um, don't complain about any form of discrimination. Um, and in fact, they show a high degree of pride in their experiences and talk about how they succeed in the informal and kind of criminalized uh, economy of, of Estonia. Um, they describe prisons as sites of networking where people gained context, contacts, which helped them to succeed in their sort of illegal activities outside the prison in between prison sentences. Um, they talked about uh, sort of successes of burglaries and, and drug smuggling. And um, prison contacts were really, uh, they really became great resources in our interviews uh, for uh, the prisoners who made friends in the prisons and then went on to sort of continue their uh, activities beyond the prison to an even more successful degree. So I call this set of resources criminal capital. Um, most people we spoke with served more than one sentence. So they kept coming back and kept coming back with the same people. And criminal justice researchers call this the revolving door of the prisons where people kind of keep reoffending. Um, but one of our study participants called this, uh, used a word that I thought was very evocative. He said in Russian, Krugovarot. It's a Krugovarot of people, uh, which means people go round and round. And here I want to quote him briefly. So. This former prisoner said, guys are constantly in there doing their time. All the same people go round and round. Everyone knows each other already. Uh, Olya, and here he refers to me. He says, Olya, you know, uh, I'll tell you, the people who hang out in all the prisons, they're all the same people. Maybe a minor can end up there by accident for something small, but the people who go round and round, they're all the same people. They all know each other. They did their time together in the old prisons and now in the new prisons and round it and round it goes. Everyone is acquainted. You already know who's who, who comes from where, who's done what. You just know. It's like, oh, here's Dmitri. So he's back again. And indeed, statistics show that 40% of people who are released are reconvicted within one year. And in 2014, a third of all Estonian prisoners were in prison for at least their fourth time. So I would argue that these uh, concepts I want to sort of very briefly introduce uh, of street habitus and this high value of criminal capital help to explain these, these logics that are at work in the interviews, which really um, don't mirror the logic of the state. And so the reproduction of these logics is made possible by this Krugovarot of the same people uh, from the same communities who share this certain set of practices and experiences. And among them, very important is the prison experience. Uh, so of course, if we focus on the logic of the state, we fail to see that in fact, some criminalized activities are measured in some parts of society as successes. For example, um, to carry out a successful burglary, you need a set of certain resources. But of course, this can come at the expense of other things that are valued in sort of other parts of society. So I'd argue that these logics um, 
in the case of Estonia, emerge out of a situation of extremely inhibited social mobility for Russian speakers. And the social mobility is inhibited by reverberations of anti-Soviet policies, which I touched upon, and by the state's criminalization of activities that are available um, to marginalized Russian speakers who don't have easy access to formal labor markets. So to conclude, I build on, on Wukong's theorization of marginality and segregation and argue that in Estonia, marginality is determined by ethnicity, modulated by class and echoes the American case rather than other European trends. But the importance of ethnicity in Estonia has to be uh, historically contextualized in class dynamics and ideologies that relate back to the Soviet system. So multi-generational class disparities are aggravated by ethnocentric nation building policies in newly independent Estonia against the backdrop of post-Soviet deindustrialization in this particular area that I talked about, which is the Northeast. And this is pretty unique to Estonia. It's a situation that disadvantages the Russian speaking minority on ethnic grounds and locks them into this dominated class position. And prisons where Russian speakers are overrepresented are sites for networking and places where this class position is solidified in the form of street habitus, where criminal capital is highly valued. And all of this has this lock-in effect, lock-in effect, I mean, uh, on those who end up behind bars and more broadly on, on their communities. So here I sort of redrew Wakan's triangle and explained um, how unemployment, over-incarceration, language and citizenship policies creates this nexus between dominated class position and Russian ethnicity, uh, which is again, locked in by street habit habitus with uh, high value of criminal capital. So I'll end there and we can open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that really fascinating overview, Olga. Olga, usually when I think about prisons, I often think that the presentation is going to focus on violence and prison is a really dingy place, whereas the narrative from you, it seems like a hunky-dory place, a wonderful community and everything's uh, uh, rosy and golden. I probably know that's not the case, but can you give a sense of how violence features in this narrative? Maybe, for example, with these, the, you know, the, 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 the shift to Euro prisons mapped onto uh, frequency and types of violence. So I'd be really interested to hear about that. But also, secondly, project, as you noted, and as I noticed, is called Gulag Echoes. And I, I imagine that's the idea that there are these legacies of the uh, Gulag system uh, that are with us now. And I certainly know that uh, uh, Judy's research has focused on that. So uh, is the policy in Estonia a conscious rejection of those echoes and conscious attempt to stop those legacies to have this very clear break with the past? And if so, uh, could you say a bit more about how that policy developed in the post-Soviet period and whether there were elements within Estonian society who resisted that? He said, it's not, it's not necessary. Prison should be bad places and that might be an argument for keeping them more Soviet. I realize that's a, a gross oversimplification, but I'd be fascinated to hear your responses to those two questions. Thank you so much. Those are, those are really uh, excellent questions. So, uh, <clears throat> The first was about prisons and violence. Um, yes, prisons are violent places and they were especially violent in this open barrack style system. Uh, we heard stories about uh, murders in prison in the 1990s with people sort of hiding, uh, uh, hiding corpses under their beds after murdering them. We heard, um, stories about prison guards being sort of uh, uh, coerced or, or kind of corrupted into taking prisoners out for a, a day of barbecuing on the beach. Um, and there was a lot of uh, power that was held in the prison by so-called prison subcultures. Um, so these are sort of, uh, in other contexts, they can be called prison gangs. Uh, and there's a particular sort of type of prison gang that emerged uh, probably in the Soviet Union, although it's not clear how we might exactly trace, um, trace the history of this phenomenon. Uh, and, and then uh, this subculture held a lot of power throughout uh, prisons on the post-Soviet space uh, through the 1990s, and Estonia was no exception to this. Um, 
And this uh, brings me kind of to the next uh, to the next question, which is the question of Soviet legacies and what happened to violence uh, after um, the prison reform to kind of the cell style accommodation. Uh, violence did go down, uh, partly because of the architecture, partly because of the greater control over prisons that was afforded by the new kind of prison setup. Um, and one of the legacies, one of the Soviet legacies that this reform aimed to uh, battle was this legacy of the power of these subcultures. Now, while the subcultures are traced by many sort of penal historians to the Soviet period, um, it seems that they were probably uh, strongest in the 1990s. And th there are different um, sort of interpretations of this, whether the subcultures are truly a Soviet legacy or, or whether they got stronger in the 1990s. Um, but either way, uh, it seems that the Estonian prison services associate the subculture with uh, Soviet times. And uh, this reform um, of the penal architecture, as well as the later of the uh, sort of prison guards and language, was explicitly anti-Soviet and anti-subculture. So sort of two things that went together in the discourse. Um, and of course, there were people who resisted. And these people were people who sort of bought into the subculture. Uh, now, here, uh, there's a bit of a problem because people who are ready to talk about their prison experience are usually people who wielded at least a little bit more power within the prison, or perhaps uh, people who were sort of uh, middle rank uh, prisoners, but probably not the people who had the worst experiences, who were, um, who, who experienced the violence themselves as victims, who uh, maybe were raped uh, continuously. Those narratives are difficult uh, to get and people are not ready to share those experiences. And so of course, there's a problem of sample bias because we talk to the people who do talk about their experience. And of course, most of the people we talk to then uh, exhibit the sort of nostalgic narrative for the old style prisons, which gave them more freedom, whether that was to kill their uh, sort of neighbor or to plant potatoes outside. And um, of course, if we get sort of any narratives from more vulnerable groups, it could be that they would possibly praise the new uh, cellular uh, structure because it will afford them greater safety. Um, most notably, these would be LGBTQ communities who were extremely marginalized by the subculture. Um, and we just don't have those, but that's something that um, we're definitely thinking about in terms of the, the bias of our narratives. Does that answer your question? It does. Oh, uh, if, if we have time, then maybe I'm interested to hear about maybe at the national level uh, between politicians and the policy debate about this shift. Was it contested or was it very clear from the uh, early 1990s that they wanted to make a clear break from the past and that the prison system was one um, obvious area in which they could break from the Soviet past as well as all the other areas? But you don't have to respond to that now. I see that Ari Treesberg has a question. Ari, over to you. Hi, thank you. Um... I am in Thailand in Estonia, and um, I had an experience a few years ago when I was this, um, I was visiting on a weekly basis the detention center here near Thailand, uh, where people are held. Um, many of them are asylum seekers, other kinds of people who don't have this kind of valid residency permit. And I was going there with a group of friends. Uh, we were trying to find ways how to support um, asylum seekers and other migrants. At some point, we were banned access. Uh, because the police had the feeling that um, they, we were somehow um, described as untrustworthy. Um, and that was the reason in the end why we were not allowed access, but the actual reason was that they had the feeling that we might start speaking about what we, what we see and experience there. Uh, one of the things that we saw, and we met many people who had been transferred to the detention center from the prison. And these were mostly Estonian residents with Russian citizenship who had um, uh, served their prison sentence. And during that time, the residence permit either had expired or it had been withdrawn. And then after the prison sentence ended, they were transferred to another prison when they were, where they were then waiting for the deportation to Russia. 
in many cases, Russia is a place where they had never been. They have no context. There are, we met people who are HIV positive, who were receiving treatment in Estonia, were concerned that they would not receive it in Russia. We met people who have children uh, in Estonia, and the police kept telling them that to your child, you can talk over Skype. And now, in the in the just in the last week, there has been some public debate uh, about it in the Estonian media as well. It turns out that, uh, especially in the recent years, it has been a uh, uh, a very conscious policy uh, by Estonian authorities to try to get rid of uh, those um, criminals uh, with uh, Russian passports. So they are actually claiming to look like uh, it's Urmas Reinsalu, the former Minister of Justice, who claims this policy as one of his own, like his own invention. And he's also claiming, look, the criminality rates have been dropping in Estonia in the recent years. And I was just wondering if, uh, if um, Olga, you have, um, during the research that you were doing, whether this issue came up and how, how your respondents were talking about it, because I think it's a very important issue that, that it, and it has been very difficult to talk about it in Estonian public sphere. It's just an exception that, this discussion happens now, but I think it will also go away very soon. And it's whole sort of, you know, also these tensions on, on the base of, of nationality. It's kind of very difficult to speak up in the name of the rights of Russian speakers who have a criminal record. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for, for your uh, very worrisome uh, account of, of this detention center. Um, you probably know more about this than I do because I actually have not had the chance to interview any of the people who are facing deportation. Uh, but this is absolutely a conscious policy and it was described by criminologists um, as a policy that the Ministry of Justice called spatial security, which I touched upon briefly. So uh, this is just, um, it's, it's a sort of combination of uh, securitizing criminals and securitizing kind of uh, ethnic and, and uh, civic belonging all together in one sort of mesh. And it's true uh, that many of the people who face this deportation, um, they were born in Estonia, they have family in Estonia, they've never been, they've never set foot in Russia. Um, and uh, this, this is a, this is probably, from what I understand from my interviews, one of the major key concerns, uh, everyday concerns of anybody who ends up in prison who has a Russian passport. Um, I've heard lots of accounts of mothers with young children who are terrified that, uh, you know, now they're in prison, but soon uh, after their sentence, they'll probably be in Russia with a ban on entry and not able to see to see their children or take care of them. And, and as you said, um, HIV medication is also another really big uh, topic for, for people who will lose access to Estonian state support for that um, if they're deported. Uh, and uh, the, the sort of futures of these people are extremely unclear. And in the future, I would be interested in tracking them down uh, on the Russian side of the border to see how their biographies sort of evolve after, after this sort of ban. Uh, I don't have the numbers on, on how many people are deported all the time uh, or, or in any period of time. I suspect, however, that the European Court of Human Rights ruling from the summer, from July 2020, in favor of Estonia's right to do this, will sort of sanction uh, more intense deportations. Again, I don't have the numbers to prove this, but I suspect that that's what such rulings are really are meant to do, and that's what they'll do, unfortunately. Um, it's interesting here to kind of reflect on how these people ended up with their Russian citizenship, and it's often very much by chance, uh, either because their parents chose that for them, or their parents chose that for themselves, and uh, possibly this, is, this often has to do with something with the uncertainty of the early 1990s in the wake of the Soviet collapse, when people just didn't know what the Soviet collapse even meant or what these new borders were or well, where they'll end up. So um, faced with a choice between statelessness and Russian citizenship, some people simply opted for Russian citizenship out of uh, some kind of practical logic, not necessarily any kind of civic sense of belonging or a civic sense of belonging that you know also evolves over time. So, so all of this is extremely complicated. Um, I was a bit surprised to see that how, how casually uh, Ministry of Justice officials talk about this 
and how how little debate there seems to be from from what I can see. Um, and and again, getting the statistics on on those deportations is one of my next um, steps that I want to do. But I did ask uh, the former prisoners I talked to about uh, their sort of indirect experiences of this, and they said yes, it's a it's a it's a really big fear among many of their friends. And each of them said that um, eight to eleven of their prison friends had been deported. I don't know if these are all, all the same people that they're all referring to, but I, I don't think so. I think that actually it's quite, it's quite large, large numbers. Uh, and yeah, uh, this, is, this is another thing that makes this Estonian system quite unique. So I don't have any straight answers or anything, but this is definitely uh, something that needs to be analyzed, tracked, traced, and definitely um, talked about more. Thanks, Olga, and thanks for the question. Uh, we have about eight minutes left. There's a question from Paris Chen in the chat, and also I see that Aglaya has uh, raised her hand. So let's take both questions. I'll read out the question from Paris, and then Aglaya can ask her question. So Paris is asking about discrimination and saying that in your presentation, you said that the interviewees didn't talk about discrimination. And Paris wants to know whether that's another you know, sign of the sample bias, that you're talking to a particular type of former prisoner, or whether something else might be going on. So that's a question from Paris, and I'll turn it over to Aglaya to ask her question. Thank you so much. That's a really that's a really important question. Um, my feeling is okay. that. Sorry, should should, should um, if we get a guy to ask her a question and then oh, yeah, you, yeah. and then we can tailor uh, because we've only got what how many minutes of left. Course. If we just ask those two questions and then yeah, you yeah. can divide the time. Thanks. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Olga, for fascinating uh, presentation. I thought it was really really interesting. What I was wondering was um, in the sort of the question of the the malleability and the flexibility of the grouping that you looked at and what i mean by that is um you know it has been 30 years since the end of soviet union right and arguably a lot of whilst you have a lot of prisoners who are repeat offenders and who you know are elderly presumably many of them are young people and often that is who end up going to prison for the first time and what i was wondering is in terms of generationally what are the strategies or are there any strategies of escaping this grouping, and I don't mean just in terms of parents trying to prevent their children from becoming uh, criminals, which I'm assuming a lot of people already try and do, but um, but literally, for example, whether there are strategies of citizenship changes and whether or not escaping that, whether or not there is their efforts basically by the older generation or breaking that chain of transmission. Uh, if that can be done in terms of paperwork, right? Um, and what happened to that was the attitude of the Estonian uh, state. But similarly, looking at what happens within prison, what is then the interrelationship between these Russian speakers, um, regardless of their passport holding, and the other Estonian prisoners, right? So if you think of the, the stereotype of an American prison, right, is it is actually quite segregated within the prison. So different groupings are staying together. Is it a similar thing that is reproduced then within an Estonian prison? Uh, and then who's, is, or is there a common shared culture that is then spread and other Estonian speakers then um, embracing that, right? And who's a dominant sort of grouping within an Estonian prison between these different sort of groups and cultural um, producers? Thank you. Thank you so much. These questions, uh, should I answer now? Or do we have okay? These questions actually. Yes, uh, please do, please do. <laughs> these questions actually fit together very nicely, so I'll try to answer kind of both of them in parts because the answer is that everything um, has to do with class, in my view, in this case. So, um, with regard to discrimination, um, there is talk of discrimination in Estonia against Russian speakers, definitely. Um, and many scholars call uh, call this sort of the invisible, the glass ceiling in Estonia, uh, and so on. Um, there's a lot of research on this, uh, but uh, a lot of the research and a lot of the discourse happens in a very different class setting. Uh, so the interviewees I talk to are not part of the sort of bourgeois middle class or aspiring middle class who um, is worried about their uh, job prospects on the official uh, job market for sort of more educated people. They're not necessarily worried at all about their voting rights. Um, they're worried about a kind of vastly different 
things. So I don't think this is sample bias actually in this case. I think um, this has to do with the class selection. And a lot of the discourses that uh, deal with how problematic uh, gray passports are or about routes out of the gray passport uh, sort of system for uh, younger people, a lot of those routes are sort of um, for uh, the middle classes and a lot of those discourses are produced by the middle classes and a lot of the incentives target the middle classes. None of this targets the people I talk to. Um, and and uh, again, I mean, part of it's a, it's a sort of um, vicious cycle because part of this has to do with the fact that the people that I talk to don't vote. And even if they could, they may not be that interested in, in, in voting. Um, so there's not a political force or a sort of uh, discursive set of discourses that includes these people, targets them, or pulls them along out of their position even. This is all for a completely different demographic. Um, so that's my answer to the part about escaping this, uh, this grouping and the strategies of changes. Yes, these do exist, but they, they exist in a bit of a different uh, place in society. Um, so... Uh, on the relation between Russian speakers and Estonian uh, and other Estonian prisoners in the prison and whether it's segregated like in the US, it doesn't seem to be as segregated as in the US. Again, things have changed over time with a, a switch from barrack style to cellular structure. But uh, I was told many times that if you don't speak Russian uh, when you enter an Estonian prison, you will definitely speak Russian once you once you leave. Um, so it's it's almost a sort of integration uh, place for uh, Estonian speakers into um, into a sort of uh, this kind of Russian speaking culture of the prison. Uh, moreover, in a lot of the narratives about prison subculture, which again, they tried to break up with this a switch uh, from the old prison architecture, but um, prison subculture still remains in some at least linguistic and cultural forms. Now in this subculture, it seems that uh, Russians tend to occupy the higher positions. Uh, and uh, I did interview uh, an Estonian, uh, an ethnic Estonian who said that he actually doesn't want to associate with any Estonians and all of his friends are Russians and he only wants to be surrounded by Russians. And I think this can be explained again by this sort of criminal capital and, um, and the, the street uh, habitus that's dominated and dictated largely by, by Russian speakers. And again, here I want to go back to class because I think class and social mobility is so difficult in Estonia for all the reasons that I mentioned, that people really try to gain the highest positions they can within the very locked in place that they do occupy. And that's the prison, that's the street habitus, and that's where they try to accumulate their capital and climb, climb to the top of their hierarchy within the confines of this particular spot. And so I would, I would say that that's the dynamic there in relation to both the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any final, very quick questions from the audience? Uh, now is your last opportunity, although we only really have a minute left. So if there aren't any last minute questions, Olga, huge thanks again for joining us today. Really a fascinating, fascinating talk and good luck with the next steps of the project. And I look forward to seeing it all come together and the comparative insights uh, that we're going to get from uh, not only Estonia, but Russia, Georgia and Romania. They're the four countries. Uh, fantastic. So uh, let me also thank the audience for joining today and uh, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you, bye. Thank you so much, bye.